Hello, welcome back to Storyhouse. Today, we will discuss the book The Power of Habits, whose subtitle is Why Do We Live and Work This Way? Just as the subtitle asks, why can some people persist in exercising and learning after work, while others only lie on the sofa and play with their phones? Why do you decide to lose weight and then can't help but buy an ice cream? For many people, it's hard to break a bad habit, let alone form a good one. How to control a power of habit to make our lives and work better is the power of habit. The core content of this book synthesizes nearly 20 years of research by scientists and business organizations on the study of habits. The author believes that as long as we master the principles and steps of habit formation, we can change deep-seated habits and rejuvenate our lives. The author of the book, Charles Duhigg, is a business investigative reporter for the New York Times who studied history at Yale University and business at Harvard Business School. His solid academic background and keen investigative skills allow him to use common and understandable examples to analyze important details in life that we overlook. Through this book, you can understand how habits work, how powerful they are, and how to form new habits or change old ones. The book starts by explaining how habits work. In the 1990s, MIT researchers wanted to understand the mechanism of habit operation and used mice for experiments. They implanted devices in the brains of the mice to monitor their brain activity and then placed the mice in a T-shaped maze with chocolate at one end. The maze was set up so that all mice stayed behind a partition, which made a loud clicking sound when opened. Initially, the mice would wander the central corridor of the maze, sniffing around corners, scratching the walls, and then it seemed they smelled the chocolate and scrambled throughout the maze. Eventually, all the mice found the chocolate. Monitoring devices showed that when the mice wandered around the maze, their brains worked very hard, processing the new information received. The researchers repeated the experiment in the same maze route hundreds of times per mouse. In this process, they found that the time and frequency of the mice stopping to sniff the corners decreased. They moved through the maze faster to find the chocolate, and the mental activity in their brains began to weaken, especially brain activity related to scratching, which completely stopped. At this time, the mice no longer needed their brains to make decisions. They just had to recall the fastest route to the chocolate. In less than a week, the brain structures related to memory stopped activity and the mice quickly turned corners in the maze to eat chocolate, which became a habit almost without thinking. This process is called chunking, which is the brain's process of turning a series of actions into an automatic behavior. Chunking is the basis for habit formation, and we live every day by a large number of chunked behaviors. For example, squeezing toothpaste before brushing teeth, not looking up when getting off the subway, and heading straight for the exit elevator. Scientists believe that habits emerge because the brain is always looking for ways to save effort. This instinct to save effort is an advantage for human survival, allowing us not to think about basic behaviors, such as how to walk or what to eat, so we have more mental power to invent and create. In experiments, researchers found that the mouse's brain is most active when it first enters the maze and hears the click of the partition lifting and when it discovers the chocolate. This is when the brain decides to give control to the habit. When the partition is not opened, the mouse finds it difficult to determine whether it is familiar with this maze or whether there might be a cat behind the partition. To deal with this uncertainty, the brain initially expends a lot of energy. Once it hears the familiar click, the mouse receives a cue that the maze might be the same as before, with chocolate. At the end of the activity, when chocolate appears in the maze, the mouse's brain becomes active again, which means it is making judgments and confirming that things are going as expected. This experiment reveals how habits are formed. First, there must be a cue, which can be an action or an event, prompting people to perform a certain habitual behavior. In biology, this cue is somewhat similar to an external or internal stimulus that puts the nervous system into a certain automatic mode, like the click of the partition lifting in the maze, 
which serves as a cue for the mouse and stimulates its brain. The second is to have a routine behavior, which is the usual behavior we often do, also called habitual behavior, which can be a physical, mental, or emotional action. For mice, this is the habitual behavior of quickly moving forward and turning after hearing the click to find the chocolate. For humans, this routine behavior could be smoking, drinking, playing games, or it could be reading and running in the morning. The third is to receive a reward. Rewards let the brain figure out whether to remember this circuit for future use. Every time a mouse finds chocolate and receives a reward, it feels satisfied and then remembers the circuit, so the next time it can get the reward effortlessly. Just like some people play games to relieve boredom, some drink to forget their troubles, the temporary escape from boredom and trouble is a reward for them, stimulating them to remember the entire circuit process from feeling bored to playing games or drinking, and then feeling satisfied. Gradually, this process, composed of cues, habitual behaviors, and rewards, repeatedly appears and becomes more and more automatic, and a habit is formed. For example, some people who have the habit of oversleeping will habitually turn off the alarm and then continue to sleep uncontrollably. In this example, the sound of the alarm serves as a cue. The nervous system receives the auditory stimulus of the alarm, which automatically leads to the behavior of turning off the alarm and then continuing to sleep and then obtaining the desired feeling of comfort and relaxation as a reward. After understanding the mechanism of habit operation, Let's share a few stories. After listening, you might exclaim that the influence of habits is so great. Let's talk about a famous case in medical history, the story of Eugene Pauly. Eugene contracted viral encephalitis at the age of 71 and subsequently lost his memory function. No matter how many times the doctors and nurses introduced themselves, he still couldn't remember their names. When he was discharged from the hospital and returned home, he also couldn't remember his old friends. But unbelievably, every morning he would get up, walk into the kitchen to make breakfast, go back to bed to play with the radio, and then repeat the same things again. And every time he saw researchers working with computers, he would be amazed and repeat the same sentence. When I was an electronic engineer, this thing had to be propped up with several six-inch shelves. Through testing, Researchers found that Eugene's memory remained before 1960. He completely forgot about his life over the past 30 years, but the habits he had formed during that time remained. Once, the researchers asked Eugene to draw a diagram of the rooms in his house, but he couldn't remember or draw it at all. They asked him how he found the toilet and kitchen when he got up in the morning. Eugene said he really didn't know, but he indeed could find the exact locations of the toilet and kitchen and he could even go shopping by himself, provided that the landmark items on the street, such as oil drums and road signs, had not changed. This is the power of habit, allowing Eugene to lead a normal life after amnesia. This example shows that habits do not disappear. They are embedded in the structure of the brain, and as long as there is a corresponding cue and reward, they will appear. Once you develop the habit of staying at home without running or eating a bite of snacks when you see them, those behavior patterns will stay in the brain forever, but the attribute of habit also has its benefits. For example, as long as you have learned to ride a bicycle, even if you don't ride for many years, you will still be able to ride. Next, let's talk about the second story, which is a story about core habits. What are core habits? They are those habits that have a decisive impact on the formation and change of other habits. Core habits seem small and insignificant, but they have a far-reaching influence. Alcoa, one of the world's largest aluminum companies, was very profitable. However, from 1986, Alcoa repeatedly made management mistakes and lost customers and profits to competitors. At this critical juncture, Alcoa appointed O'Neill as the new CEO. To turn the company's fate around, he only proposed a small, easily measurable indicator that was applicable to everyone, which was to reduce the company's injury rate to zero at any cost. O'Neill required that any injury be reported to him within 24 hours, 
and simultaneously proposed countermeasures to prevent such incidents from happening again. Subordinates who achieved this could be promoted. Those who didn't were dismissed. During the 13 years from O'Neill's appointment to his retirement, he focused on this small indicator. Although this indicator seemed insignificant compared to sales revenue and profit growth rates, it had a core influence. To achieve a zero injury rate, reports had to be submitted to senior management within 24 hours of an incident, necessitating a simplification of the complex management structure to ensure quick reporting through the management layers. Consequently, the company's organizational structure was adjusted, becoming more flat, and the management level of the senior personnel fundamentally changed. Unexpectedly, as the injury rate continuously decreased, employee satisfaction and morale increased, and sales revenue and profits also grew. O'Neill made the zero injury rate a core habit for all Alcoa employees, accelerating the development of other good habits and completely transforming Alcoa's behavior pattern. Another example is from the past decade when researchers studied the impact of exercise on daily behavior. They found that when people develop a habit of exercising, even just once a week, they unknowingly change other related behavior patterns. People who exercise tend to eat better, work more efficiently, smoke less, are more patient with family and friends, use credit cards less, and experience less stress. So. The next topic is how to develop new habits or change old ones. Let's first listen to a story about forming new habits. In the early 19th century, as the economy improved, wealthy Americans began buying high sugar, finely made foods in large quantities, leading to a steep decline in the nation's oral health. Even during military conscription by the government, many were found to have cavities and heart diseases. Despite this, Americans still didn't like brushing their teeth until a toothpaste called Pepsodent appeared. Before Pepsodent, there were already several toothpaste products in the country, but none were successful. However, with the efforts of advertiser Hopkins, within just 10 years, Pepsodent not only got 65% of Americans into the habit of brushing their teeth, but also remained the best-selling toothpaste in the country for over 30 years and became one of the best-selling products. Globally, Hopkins believed that to sell Pepsodent, there must be a trigger to get Americans into the habit of brushing their teeth. After reading many dental books, he got an idea when he came across Dental Plock. He promoted Pepsodent as a creator of beauty that could eliminate the film on teeth, and through advertising, made the dental film a cue for brushing teeth, a trigger for forming the habit. Hopkins began designing advertisements, and soon these flyers were everywhere. Let's read a part of the ad, just lick your teeth, and you will feel a film. It makes your teeth look unattractive and causes cavities. Generally, after reading this, people would subconsciously lick their teeth and feel the film. According to his plan, the reward of using Pepsodent was even more tempting. The first advertisement for Pepsodent went like this. Notice how many people around you have beautiful teeth. Millions are using this new method of teeth cleaning. Which woman would want a dark film on her teeth? Pepsodent can drive away the film. Indeed, who doesn't want to be beautiful and have a lovely smile? Especially when all it takes is brushing with Pepsodent. Hopkins wrote in his autobiography that his success was due to a series of marketing rules he created that made it easy for consumers to form new habits. First, find a simple and obvious cue, like dental film. Second, clearly state what the reward is, such as clearing the film. These two rules revolutionized the advertising industry and became a model in marketing textbooks for over 200 years. However, these two rules alone weren't enough to create a habit. The third rule is creating a craving. Pepsodent's ingredients included citric acid, peppermint oil, and other chemicals intended to make the toothpaste taste fresher. Unexpectedly, this resulted in a tingling sensation on the user's tongue and gums. After Pepsodent dominated the market, competing companies quickly studied its success. They found that if customers forgot to brush with Pepsodent, they felt their teeth were dirty because they lacked that tingling sensation. They believed that only with this sensation could they be sure their mouths were clean. 
In other words, customers began to crave and anticipate the tingling sensation Pepsodent provided. Once they associated this feeling with cleanliness, brushing teeth became a habit. Today, almost all toothpastes contain these additives, whose sole function is to provide a stimulating sensation after brushing to remind consumers, I have brushed my teeth. My mouth is clean. The story of Pepsodent demonstrates that a craving feeling is driving the habit. Finding a way to trigger this craving makes creating new habits easier. In summary, the secret to forming new habits is to find a suitable cue, add a reward for habit formation, and cultivate a craving for this reward. Another example, if you want to develop a habit of exercising regularly, you can choose a cue, such as getting up and seeing the window, then going to change shoes for a run. Then find a reward, like a perfect body. When you imagine walking on the street and receiving envious glances for your figure, you will crave a good physique. This feeling will make you want to exercise more every day, and gradually, fitness becomes your new habit. Now, having talked about how to form new habits, Let's discuss how to change old ones. Although habits become very stable once formed, they are actually quite easy to change. The secret lies in the golden rule, which is to replace the original behavior with a new one between the same cue and reward. In the summer of 2006, a 24-year-old college graduate named Mandy sought a psychologist's help for her nail-biting habit. She said she had this habit since childhood and often couldn't help but bite her nails stopping only when they bled. This habit had affected her social and romantic life. She had tried nail polish designed to stop nail biting, but it was completely ineffective. So, she hoped the psychologist could help her. The psychologist decided to implant a new behavior into Mandy's life according to the golden rule. Through analysis, the psychologist found that Mandy's nail biting was due to boredom. She craved a strong sense of fulfillment and the fulfillment from nail-biting was the reward. So, the psychologist told Mandy that whenever she felt uncomfortable with her fingers, she should immediately do something physically stimulating, like rubbing her palms or tapping her knuckles on the table. Later, the doctor assigned her a new task. Whenever she felt uncomfortable, she would draw a check mark on paper. When she successfully resisted the nail-biting habit, she would draw a slash. A week later, Mandy only bit her nails three times and drew seven checks. She rewarded herself with a nail care session and continued the substitute behavior of drawing checks and slashes. After a month, she no longer bit her nails. Mandy's story shows that habits can never be completely eradicated. To change a habit, you must keep the cue and reward from the old habit, but insert a new behavior. Let's take quitting smoking as an example. Many people smoke not because they like nicotine, but because they feel smoking relieves stress and helps them relax. Quitting smoking simply involves replacing smoking a cigarette with another substitute behavior that provides the same sense of inner relief when under stress. This behavior could be talking to someone or exercising, as long as it achieves the same effect and reward. However, when old habits are too stubborn, Another supporting factor is needed, faith, the belief that one can change bad habits. At this time, groups can play a significant role. Because when you're alone, you may doubt your ability to change. But when a group of people comes together, they encourage each other and build faith. What was just discussed were the principles of changing old habits, but the author provides a practical guide in the book on how to implement these changes. The first step is identifying habitual behaviors. The author shares his own example, where he had a bad habit of going to a cafe to buy chocolate chip cookies while writing, which caused him to gain 8 pounds. To break this habit, he plastered his computer with reminder notes, but it was ineffective. He then began analyzing his habits, starting with identifying the habitual behavior he wanted to change, getting up from his desk every afternoon, walking to the cafe, buying chocolate chip cookies, and eating them while chatting with friends. He pondered over more covert issues, such as what triggered this behavior, boredom, hunger, or perhaps needing a break before starting the next task, 
with eating cookies as a way of taking a break. What then was the reward? Was it the cookies, the change of environment, a temporary distraction, or chatting with friends? To figure this out, one needs to perform the second step, conduct small experiments. To identify which cravings are driving the habit, experiment with different rewards. The author adjusted his habitual actions, like not going to the cafe, but instead taking a walk around the community, or going to the cafe but buying donuts instead of chocolate chip cookies, or buying cookies but not chatting with friends. In essence, conduct scientific experiments, changing one variable while keeping others constant, and observe whether different behaviors provide a satisfying reward. The author found that he felt satisfied even without going to the cafe for chocolate chips. Simply chatting with friends was enough, indicating that what he desired was temporary relaxation and conversation. Once the habitual behavior and the reward are identified, the next step is to find the cue. Scientific experiments show that nearly all habit cues fall into one of five categories location, time, emotional state, other people, and the action immediately preceding the cue. So, when trying to identify the cue for the habit of going to the cafe to buy chocolate chip cookies, record these five key pieces of information when you have the thought, where are you? What time is it? What is your emotional state? Who is around you? What did you do right before thinking about buying cookies? By recording multiple times, you can clearly see which piece of information appears most frequently, which is the cue for your habit of buying cookies. The final step is to make a plan, like the author who liked to go buy cookies in the afternoon. Through the steps above, he found that the cue usually appeared around 3 p.m. So, he made a plan to visit a friend's office for a 10-minute chat every day at 3 p.m. To ensure he remembered to do this, he set an alarm for 3 p.m. on his watch. Initially, he often forgot, but later he forced himself to follow the plan. Every time the alarm rang, he immediately went to his friend's office to chat for 10 minutes. Eventually, this behavior became spontaneous, and even without an alarm, he would stand up at 3 p.m. to chat with someone nearby and then return to work. This all became his new habit. Although changing certain habits can be difficult, requiring a long time, repeated experiments and failures, once you understand the principles of habits and can analyze the cues, habitual behaviors, and rewards, you have the power to overcome habits. That's all for the interpretation of the power of habit in this book. Congratulations on completing another book summary, and thank you for your support and attention.